Welcome to the Loving Truth Podcast, where it's all about finding clarity, confidence, and peace in the face of marriage challenges. And now your host, relationship expert and certified master life coach, Sharon Pope. Hello, loves. This is Sharon Pope, and this is The Loving Truth. I have a real treat for you today. Um, I often do not share my clients in a public way, but this particular woman had an experience that I think is so important to share in a in a broader way. Um, so, and she also said that she wanted to be on the podcast. And so I said, you know what, let's do it. Let's do it. Because sometimes when you hear from me, it's, it's one thing, but when you hear it from someone who has, has been walking through this for the last year plus, <laughs> and, and still is walking through it, it takes on different life and it makes it more real. And so the fact that she's willing to share her experience, I'm just eternally grateful. So my guest today is Julie Ziba. She was married for how many years? 22. 22 yep. years. You had two children together and yep. you're a parent coach. I am. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So I can I interrupt you just to say please thanks for having me because I think the world of you and the work we did together. So I just want to say thank you. Hey, I, I get I, I get some time to talk to Julie. So it's a good day. <laughs> it's a good day in Sharon Pope's world. <laughs> okay. So I am as you know, I'm I often will talk about how if you need to end a relationship, you want to try to do it in the lo- in the most loving and peaceful way possible. However, there is some fine print there, which is not everyone wants to be loving and peaceful. And so how do you keep your peace while navigating what might be considered by many people a high conflict divorce? And yet you still have to keep going. So that's sort of where I want to dive in with you today. So let's start in a in an obvious place, which is, okay, we met, it's more than a year ago, I feel like. Was it a year? I, yeah, I think it was at maybe even a year and like nine months. Oh my goodness. How, yeah. It tells you how long it's been going on. Okay. So tell me if you can take yourself back to where you were when we first met, what you were feeling where you are at with your decision, how long you'd been in a decision, just sort of, if you can give us a sense for where you were mentally and emotionally. Sure. Sure. I had been at this for five to seven years at minimum Mm -hmm. wondering, should I stay or should I go? Mm -hmm. And I was feeling obligated in many ways to stay because um, I was the most functional person in the relationship when we're talking about things like holding down a job or managing the children's needs. Um, Our children are also uh, have some special needs. And so everything was riding on my shoulders. And I really was feeling like so, so, so exhausted by carrying all of it. And so I think I felt lost. I could not get clarity on what I could do to save myself. Mm-hmm. I felt incredibly manipulated. I did not feel heard. And I felt afraid. I mean, for sure. I was scared of what might happen if I prioritized myself and um, spoke up, used my voice in my marriage. What do you think was your biggest fear? My biggest fear was the explosion that would happen and my bigger kind of like overarching fear was that my children would not be okay. Yeah. Like yeah. And they are now 12 and almost 17. Mm-hmm. So at the time, you know, they were, they're tweens, they're not babies. Yeah. So they were um, old enough to understand that there's conflict in the home mm-hmm. before we we were no longer in the same space and young enough to be heavily impacted by having two separate homes. Did yeah. they ever say anything to you about the conflict that they would see or experience or overhear? Yeah, that was one of the um, very biggest challenges was um, they would have a conflict 
with their father mm -hmm. and come running to me uh, in their fear. Mm -hmm. Dad's berating me. Dad's doing X, Y, Z. Dad did this to me. Mm -hmm. And they would kind of tattle to me. And then I would hold space for them to talk to him directly. You know, as a parent coach, like I, I really didn't want to get in the middle of it. Yeah. And I knew it wasn't okay for them to continue to experience that in their lifetime. Yeah. So yeah. you had lots of really good reasons, maybe from the outside looking in, or maybe your girlfriends had told you for a long time, like, Hey, you know, you really need to consider potentially ending this. So yeah. as you, as you look back at that time, when you were able to come to clarity around that, the, the, the right decision for you and your family really was to end the relationship. What do you, what, what do you think? And it probably wasn't one thing, but like, what were the, what were the inputs that helped you get to that decision so a couple things one you're you're absolutely right people in my life said this isn't okay the way you're being treated people in my life when I tried to talk to them about it they would say I'm surprised you stayed this long mm -hmm. so I guess I got some validation that I wasn't getting in my marriage about what I was thinking and feeling and you know these are loving people so they were also able to see me fully so when I said you know here's where I think I'm really screwing up they're like yeah because you guys have an unhealthy dynamic, right? So they didn't sugarcoat it for me and say, he's a bad guy because we both had responsibility in it. Mm -hmm. But I think what really pushed me to make a final decision, two things. One is we were in couples therapy for the 9,000th time I had set up. And that therapist said, I think you guys should separate for six months and take a break and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And that happened for me in the context of being in your course. Right. So. I was in your course and I think the the like I have these words that of yours that like come into my head <laughs> <laughs> I'm in your head uh, Julie in a really really healthy way um <laughs> no but um probably like if I thought about just the key words that stuck with me one was stay in your lane mm -hmm. just stay in your lane don't try to solve things for him mm -hmm. just stay in your lane and be loving and I was so like centered at that point around not being angry or upset or unkind, but just exhausted. When I stayed in my lane, it became crystal clear. When I didn't keep trying to fix it, when I didn't keep trying to fix him yeah. under your guidance, I mean, all credit to you. <laughs> when I stopped, when I was able to step back and see it for what it was, mm -hmm. that's when the clarity came. And that came through working with you. And then the other, can I use how language? Yeah, <laughs> okay. for sure. <laughs> the more, the better. You know me, I'm not going to keep it clean. Okay. Um, <laughs> the other thing that happened is you said to me, you know, if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. Yeah. And not for the not for the marriage itself, but for the tiny decisions mm -hmm. along in my day where, you know, if he uh, did something and was asking something of me that was mm -hmm. what at the time felt unreasonable, it was a hell no mm -hmm. in a loving way. I didn't use that language in my marriage, but for myself in my own head. So, yeah, staying in my lane and hell yes and hell no, those were big things I carried with me. Um, but it was your program that gave me the clarity to see what was actually happening. Did you ever get cold feet in the process? Like, oh, maybe I should just go back and make it fine. And I'll just, I know how to do this. I'll just do all the things again. You know, Sharon, to be really, really clear, I, I have cold feet today, even all the way through this whole thing. Not cold feet that I shouldn't have done it, but as I think we'll end up talking about, it's a pretty high complex situation. And yeah. I have um, no regrets at all. Mm -hmm. But I get cold feet about daily interactions and conversations I still have to have. Yeah. Because I still have to interact. This is still the father of my parent or father of my parent. Definitely not the father <laughs> of my parents. The father of my children. Um, so like I said, you know, you, your voice in my head, it just carries with me. It keeps coming, thankfully. Mm -hmm. And some I've done a lot of other work as well. And so what, what does that answer your question? Yeah. Like so I guess, yeah. cold feet. and it's not even, I think what you're me. talking about though, it isn't even, I mean, maybe it's cold feet, but it's more like anxiousness or yeah. a, a little like, this is tough. This is still tough. This it's is not easy. A little pattern that comes back for sure. And when you're asking, if you kind of think about cold feet, like when I was actually had made my decision, mm -hmm. it took me months to formulate my words. Yes. So I, 
it was a little bit of cold feet. It was a little bit of like, am I actually going to do this after thinking about it for almost a decade? I mean, that's a big deal. That, that, you- that, cause it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to think about it in your head. And it's a whole different deal to say those words out loud and then really begin walking through what we call the ring of fire. <laughs> that, oh, oh mm-hmm. I danced in that ring. for. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wasn't going it alone. Yeah. And that was, you know, I knew that you were going to walk through with me. And mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And you also, you have, you have great support around you too, which I've always loved when you would share those things with me. I was like, I love that you have really solid girlfriends that will tell you the truth and that will love on you, love you enough to tell you the truth. And I'm so fortunate to have that. I don't take it for granted for one day. And I also have a loving family. Yes. Um, But what I had to do is get honest with them. As I got more honest with myself, I also had to share some truths that were uncomfortable with them, Mm -hmm. but those people didn't leave, right? (laughs) And you kind of figure some stuff out. You're like, oh, I can actually be me. Yeah. I I can tell the ugly and the people who love me will still love me. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So give us a hint here as to when you knew that, oh, this is not going to be loving and peaceful and simple Um, you know in retrospect it's so funny because it's hard to separate what was happening in the moment versus what my actual reality is Mm -hmm. um I knew it wasn't going to be loving and peaceful because no matter how I attempted throughout my marriage to present something difficult I was met with blame shame um anger defensiveness Mm -hmm. and there was never accountability on the other person's part yes Um, and I think that, you know, one thing I want to say that's super important to me in this conversation is that I am not joining you in this conversation to create a picture of a horrible person. Right. What I need to do is to say it can get really, really ugly and really hard. And when you come into it with an assumption of everybody is doing the best that they can, Mm -hmm. my assumption is he's doing the best that he can. Right. Uh, I think all of us have childhood trauma, all of us have adult trauma, all of us have pain, all of us experience the difficulty of being human, <laughs> being human hard work. That's right? a beautiful way to say uh, it, yeah. So I think you, coming at it with some compassion is really important to me. So little side note there. Yeah, um, it's important. That said, I did get the um, opportunity to set a lot of boundaries. <laughs> the <around>. opportunity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, around how I was going to be spoken to, for example, yeah. over the phone. I set a ground rule. If there will be yelling, I will be hanging up. And then I followed through on that. Yeah. Um, so when did I know? You know, Sharon, the minute I said the words I needed to say with loving kindness, it was met with an explosion um, I suggested a separation and was met with an F you. I want a divorce as fast as possible. And it has been a fight from that day forward. Right. Um, and- it has been, I believe, out of panic and fear. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, like I really kept this boat afloat. And I was essentially saying to an adult, you know, now you get to stand on your own two feet. And for whatever reason, my my shortcomings, his shortcomings in the marriage, that was not happening. Yeah, yeah. It's, it um, was pretty. And that relates to what you were talking about earlier, where, you know, stay in your lane. Because that might not make sense to people like, okay, yeah. One thing is when you go out of your lane, you abandon yourself because you're over here mm-hmm. in someone else's business, which means you can't simultaneously be there for your business. But right. the but that other that other piece that you're talking about is so important. It's like when you, especially if you're over-functioning and someone else is under-functioning, the minute you pull yourself out of that dynamic, they have to find their footing and they're going to wobble. They're going to, it's not going to just happen. They're not just going to step up and be the adult in their life and make the decisions and do all the things because they haven't, they haven't had a practice of doing any of that because- you are doing that. Right. A hundred percent. And they, it will take time to undo the pattern of, well, this isn't happening for me because of you. You're not doing. 
some like I was doing right. something wrong. We, that pattern takes a long time. I will say, you know, a year and it's been a year mm-hmm. since he moved out. And I will say he, for the first time, is volunteering at my kid's school. He needs taking my kids to a birthday party and buying a present. And my kids are getting the best version of a dad they've ever had. And I think despite the fact that we're still having tons of challenges bringing this to the finish line, um, I'm so happy for my kids. I, oh my God, I love hearing that. I mean, it's not the first time I've heard it where literally it ends up being the healthiest thing for that other person. They may not be able to see it that way. Yeah. Especially not at the time, but boy, on the other side of it, in hindsight, you can look back and go, these were things that were never happening in terms of the, even if you just take the, the, the child father relationship, there are so many points of connection or opportunities for connection between father and kids that wasn't happening because he didn't have to do those things. And then as soon as you get out of the way, then it's like, oh, now they, like, I remember one of my clients telling me, she goes, oh my gosh, my kids have a better relationship now with their father than they ever did when we were married. And I will say, Sharon, that's like one of the most humbling, hardest, biggest pieces of grief in this process for me is that I played a role in them not being able to be connected. Mm. And I had to move through that. That Mm -hmm. came. And, and went because I, I know I was yeah. also doing the best. I have a lot of compassion for myself, you know, we're Good all doing you. the best. we can. Um, so I don't carry that with me like a heavy burden. However, I want to be clear that that's part of the process. You go through like, dang it, I was in the way mm-hmm. of that having that because of the role I was playing and you get to kind of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and say, Oh, I'm going to do it differently now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that, them they're they're still evolving in their relationship and my relationship with my kids has changed oh how so you know I really was doing it all before like I was fun mom I was getting our schoolwork done mom I was (laughs) therapy mom like I was doing I homeschooled my kids for a while like before the pandemic I did everything and um I'm not doing it all anymore and they're learning like, oh, maybe I can do this by myself. Maybe yeah. I can ask dad for that. Maybe, you know, so I think, um, and also it's their age, right? They're tweens and teens now. Yeah. So I'm stepping back a little bit. And aside from this conversation, like that's one of the hardest thing parents don't talk about is like the grieving process you go through when your kids outgrow you. Like mm-hmm. they're, It's good. It's a really healthy sign. They're doing what they're supposed to do. Yes. But my relationship with them now is more... Um, Businessy uh-huh. during the day, kind of <laughs> snuggly, right? Like, but they probably wouldn't be cool with too many people. No <laughs> <We're going. laughs> um, yeah, we are also what I can say is they, because of the way I think I carried myself through this process and probably their life, but especially during this difficult time, I have never spoken ill of their father to them. Mm-hmm. I have never put them in the middle of anything. And I have worked really, really hard to be honest with them without oversharing. Mm -hmm. My kids will come to me and say, hey, mom, we've got a problem. Yeah. So, you know, when there's something amiss, they will come and say, hey, mom, I screwed up without fear. Nice. Or, hey, mom, this doesn't fit right. And they're not afraid to come to me and say, hey, I'd like to spend some more time with my dad. Inside, Sharon, I I crumble a little bit when that (laughs) happens because I'm like, what? Yes. Yes. Outside. It's like, Oh, cool. Let's figure out how we can make that happen. Yeah. You know, I have a, I have a good friend who she has a, a saying or a phrase that she'll use oftentimes where it's, and she told me, she goes, you know, you, when you go through a divorce, you will be challenged a thousand different ways um, around the, do you really put your kids first? Do you really put your kids first? Right. And even what you're talking about that little, like, Hey, I want to spend some more time with dad. And you're like, mm. it feels like a punch to the gut, you know? Um, but you don't show it. And because you want them to have a healthy relationship with their dad, just like you want them to have a healthy relationship with you and everyone else in their lives. And one of the things that she says um, is, you know, people will always say, I'll, I'll run in front of a bus for my kids. 
And she's like, really? But will you be, will you be kind and compassionate to your ex-husband for the benefit of your kids? Right. Will, Will you give them the benefit of the doubt? Will you say like, they're doing the best they can, even when it looks like a shit show, they're doing the best they can. It's okay. Yeah. And I've been so honest in a sense with my kids too, around like, you know, Hey guys, today I'm not my best self. Divorce uh, is a really tricky thing. You know, we got to deal with courts and lawyers and just stuff. And it's a lot to think about. I've had so many meetings this week and I'm kind of tired. And I just want you to know that's why I'm not my best self. It has nothing to do with your dad, nothing to do with you. It's just a lot yeah, because of our system. And so I do explain enough about the system because it's that's true that the system is challenging. Mm-hmm. And then they know it's really not about our family dynamic. Yeah. It's nothing because we're still a family. We just look different now. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for yeah. saying that, because I think that gives people permission to not always have to put on the happy face and fake it in front of their children. Because I also think that like there's this balance between are you lying to yourself and or them? Like, you know, everything's fine. It's just great. <laughs> um, yeah. Without without putting adult burdens on children who don't have uh-huh. fully formed yeah. brains, who have no capability to wrap their minds around an adult relationship that's been together for 20 plus years and the challenges associated with that. Like we don't have to yank them into adulthood and put them right smack in the middle of our relationship. And yet it's okay to have a bad day and just own it. And I think, I think that that is a really powerful thing for children to see their parents as human beings. Oh, a hundred percent. And, um, you know, I think it builds up trust too. Like if I go to them and just say, Hey, here's what's going on with me, then they learn that that's a normal thing to do. And then they'll come and talk to me. Yeah. Uh, you asked me a question earlier though, and it, it's making me think of something else. If you don't mind me switching yeah. just a tiny bit, um, parents, I mean, this is just hard. And I, but I think where we do have some influence is I go back to that saying that it takes for each child, each child in their lifetime needs one adult to help them feel like they matter, they belong, and they have influence in their lives. They need one adult. Yeah. So you can look at that and say, well, okay, I need to be that adult because my ex is who they are. But the truth is, that means you don't always have to be that adult. I can be that adult most of the time, but when I'm having a bad day, as you were saying, I can let someone else carry that. It could be yeah. grandma, it could be uncle, it could be their dad, it could be our friend. So it takes one adult that's consistent mm. in their life to do that. So I, I rely on that. And then the other thing is that I rely on, this goes back a little bit to the high conflict piece, um, is I can teach my kids life skills so that when my partner is um, not managing his own emotions with my kids that they know how to handle that so they don't end up 20 years later yes. going um, I was being manipulated right yes so um, this high conflict piece that we were talking about it's really important that we not only stay in ourselves but then we're like co-regulating with our kids and teaching them how to manage Difficult people. Yeah, because they're going to come up against difficult people. I would say, like, right. like not everyone is easy to love, like you all. <laughs> like the kids, the kids can be easy to love. Not everyone is as easy to love. <laughs> uh, well, and that piece I just mentioned about co-regulation yeah. is people aren't always easy to love, but it's a lot easier to love someone who's not lashing out at you. For sure. Sure. Children are very hard to love sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> They're dumb though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So real quick, before we move into the high conflict piece, just because you brought it up and I, I am yeah. fascinated by it. I'm I'm curious to know if this experience, because I believe it had to have, but did this experience change your parent coaching practice in any way? Oh. Yes. Uh, a thousand percent. Um, so as you know, my background is I'm a dietitian. So I was doing mostly parent coaching around feeding dynamics, um, and feeding therapy. Mm -hmm. This experience, however, uh, really helped me broaden that, um, because the parents I was engaging with were having issues beyond feeding, which I've known for years and years and years. And I really just reframed it to parent coaching because it's all the same thing. Yes. It's 
it boils down to exactly what you talk about, you know, like the feeling heard and seen and loved. Like, mm-hmm. like that's it. That's the secret sauce. Yeah. Like it's, it's a secret sauce for, as you would say, like people in, in a relationship. They're human beings. Right. <laughs> if you want a relationship with other human beings, that's what we're all looking for, right? Yeah. Uh, so 100%. It also, um, I, you know, I'm a firm believer that lived experience really is the pathway to coaching. And now that I've had this lived experience, I'm working with a couple of people who are um, navigating their decision to stay or go. And really, how do we, and specifically related to their children. Sure. And so, yeah, it, I mean, I think there's just, you go through life and things call you and you follow the light and you go toward it. And I mean, not in a dead way. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> activating pretty well. I didn't mean it that way, but um, you just kind of pay attention. Yeah. And I think the work I did with you kept me grounded enough that I could pay attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go there. Let's talk about the high conflict piece. Yes. I went out of my way to try to work through a collaborative divorce. What I learned through that process after 10 months was that I had erroneously engaged in a process with a high conflict personality. Mm -hmm. What that means is uh, that the other party was not able to operate in a collaborative manner. What ended up happening is they didn't choose to show up after 10 months of work, attorney fees, a collaborative process, which for people who are able to pull it off, I highly, highly recommend it. I think it's um, really important work to keep people out of courts. I think it's better for families. So I I don't want to undermine collaborative divorce at all. However, for people who are in a situation where there are unmanaged emotions, there's defensiveness, there's berating, There's shaming and blaming, punishing. There's an inability to answer emails. There's a lot of factors. I do think that it might be a futile effort or at least something worth discussing with a collaborative person to find out if it's the right path for for everybody. It turned out I went through the whole thing. I thought we got to the finish line. We made agreements with each of our respective attorneys. We had a signing date. Yes. I signed. He didn't show up to sign. So we started all over again with a non-collaborative divorce. (laughs) And that was 10 months in? Or was that longer? No, that was 10 months in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think that um, the, the signs were on the wall. I was just continuing to refuse to see them in a lot of ways. I was still expecting it could be different. Mm -hmm. I could still negotiate with this person. Mm -hmm rather than stepping back and and not trying so hard. I was still over, as you uh, talk about often, I was still over-functioning big time. And I had to just let it go. I had to let go of so much. And I tell you, Sharon, the day I just met with my new attorney and I said, here you go, good luck. (laughs) Yeah. I changed my name at that point. I got on with my rebranding of my business. Mm -hmm. I just started moving forward. I started living my life. You're like, this is, you know what? That's so smart. I often tell people like, it's like you, you engage with an attorney, you know, when you, when that feels like the right next move for you. But then I find so many people still carry all the stress, all the struggle, what should be done next. I need to make sure they're doing that. And, And I'm like, let you're paying them a lot of money let them carry this for you they're the experts in this this is this is negotiation and paperwork and so yeah yeah i think you did the most healthy thing which is just like let me get back in my lane here now this is going to eventually come to an ending i mean eventually it has to come to an ending it's just a matter of how and when i know (laughs) i do promise it has to eventually come to an end (laughs) And so, yeah, and then you just started moving your life forward in a productive way. And it wasn't an FU way. It was like, okay, someone else is going to manage this now. I don't have to do a lot of this heavy lifting. Now, now I'm going to focus on me a little bit. Yeah. How am I going to take care of my house? How am I going to take care of my kids? How, and um, 
you know, it would be dishonest to say I don't spend any time and energy on it anymore. Sure. It's still a ton of time and energy. But on the daily, I don't have to manage it. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. And it's created a lot of space for me to work more. Uh, and I really enjoy my work. So yeah. um, I'm fortunate in that regard. Um, it's allowed me space to just go hiking with my kids. It's allowed me space to engage more socially, to travel with my friends. Like, yeah, things that bring me joy. You go see pink. You go see pink twice in, <laughs> or three, three times in one month. Oh, my gosh. I'm taking my daughter. Yeah. That's awesome. So um, in any case, the I think we were talking a little bit about um, the high conflict piece. And I think the word that came to my mind when you asked me that is just acceptance. Accepting it is what it is. I have to accept that I can't have it the way I want it. Yeah. Byron and Katie says, every time you argue with reality, you will lose. <laughs> this is the reality of the situation. Absolutely. And it's once you let go of the piece about it's a bad person and you do things with love in your heart and kindness. Okay. What does that look like? Seriously, what does love in your heart and kindness look like when you're going through a really difficult divorce? Like give some sense of like, how does that show up? What does that look like? When you get a, a message, a text, when you get um, something like that, that is adversarial. Mm -hmm. Your reply is calm, mm -hmm. timely, and focused. Yeah, I, what I did is I um, ended up studying with the High Conflict Institute with Bill Effie, yeah, who wrote a great book called Splitting Up, another great book for kids called Don't Alienate the Kids, just some great places to go if you're in a high conflict situation. And so mm -hmm. I, I got so into it that I ended up becoming a coach for people going through Bill Eddy's program. So wow. I meet with people and that can actually be a court mandated um, parenting program in some States, not where I live, but it's a great program for anybody. And, and it's inexpensive. It's like $49. So compared to other parenting programs out there, it's, yeah. it honors the fact that divorce is expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, in any case, I digress because I do. Um, <laughs> but one thing I learned from Bill Eddy and other people is something called a BIF response, which means your response is brief, informative, firm, and friendly. Brief, informative, Always. firm, and friendly. I like it. If the text says some kind of, I'm not thinking of a good example, I'm just going to make one up, but yeah. like if the text said something like, you didn't bring back Sarah's lunchbox from uh, from your house, so now I don't have anything to pack in their lunch. Okay, my reply can be, "Thanks for letting me know." Informative can be like the lunchbox. I can drop the lunchbox off at noon. Mm -hmm. I was unaware. Is the in the you know that was informative. The firm part is I was unaware that the lunchbox needed to be there. If you need me to do that, please let me know ahead of time and friendly. Thanks so much. Have a nice day. There you go. Brief. It's a bit, it's called a bit of response and it's um, so pivotal. So I would imagine that even after sending that text, you're able to just take a breath and go on about your day. You're not like, Oh, how dare he? And who's he think he is? And you don't like carry all that gunk around. Absolutely. You're, you're taking your power back. You solved the problem. You set a boundary that was kind and you also put in an action plan so that you're asking for something to be different next time. Yeah. Without telling someone what to do and with zero expectation that their behavior will change because you can't have that because you're only in control of, of your own behavior, right? That's it. I cannot control when the reply is going to come, if they're going to follow the protocol we agreed to. We have agreed to so many things <laughs> that just don't happen. Yeah. And so I have no expectation that they will happen. And yet I keep, getting the opportunity to say, here's what I will do, mm -hmm. not here's what you need to do differently. Right. Um, and that bit of response just gives me that, that tool to say, Hey, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I have control over. Yeah. You do you. I okay. love that. You. Yep. Yep. So, you know, you said something that is so important, which is you can only control yourself. 
you cannot control other people, which we all know, but it doesn't stop us from trying to control the circumstances and people in our lives. So can you give a sense for how you were able to keep your peace? And it's not like you never dip, take a dip. You never like get upset or you never get frustrated or you never get sad or any of that. It just like, how do you, how did you keep your peace when things got really tough? All right. You said I could be, use my language. Huh? So yes. as you know, I came up with a little mantra Yes. during our time together. Yes. And my mantra was, I am Zen as fuck. Yes. And um, I also had another mantra, which was, I will not drown in your melancholy. Good. And I'm not sure I heard that one. Those two mantras, I am Zen as fuck, and I will not drown in your melancholy, because there was some melancholy going on, and I didn't want to be part of it. I was choosing joy. So I have a mantra. Mm -hmm. I journal religiously. I am not a religious person, but I, I, I do journal. <laughs> journal all the time. <laughs> journal. Um, I also started studying some somatic work, some yes. body experience experience work and that um, I had done some of that professionally as a dietitian mm -hmm. and in some of my other work uh, around the teroceptive awareness and how our body really is our kind of the tool that we have to, to heal our brains. So it's, we can, you know, if we're having pain in our shoulder or our back or whatever, we try to use our brain to, to heal it. But if we reverse that and we use our body to heal our brain, we can much more quickly get back into a state of a functioning brain rather than our fight or flight or freeze or fawn, right? Yes. Um, so things like tapping, things like rolling on the floor, things like dancing, mm -hmm. lots of dancing, just yes. anything to get me into my physical body. Yoga, uh, I like to pretend to run, but <laughs> it's more like, <laughs> It's not like a woggish waddle at this age, but it's all good. And so a lot of movement and physical things. Um, when I'm having a particularly difficult, um, oh, therapy. I've also been in therapy. Yeah. So I don't want to say, yeah, he did not do this alone. I can call a friend. I could do lots of things. Yeah, it takes a process. I think you also had me write down uh, during our time together. I had two really important lists. Yes. Um, but I still reference them to this day. One is you had me list the reasons why the relationship was not sustainable. What had happened to me over time that gave me clues of why it wasn't working, why the patterns were unhealthy. Yeah. So when I have those moments of doubt, like, you know, he'll yell at me and that, that younger part of me will come out and I'll be like, oh, I did the wrong thing. I messed up here. I go back and I look at that list. I'm like, oh, I didn't mess up. That's the pattern. Yes. So I do that. And the other list is I have is things I can do when I'm upset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have those actually taped to a wall. So, um, you know, I worked with uh, with you as a coach to say, what, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And so in the moment when my brain is upset and I am having a response, I'm not trying to figure out what to do in that moment. I already have a plan. Yeah. And that's been so pivotal for me because then I don't have to be like, okay, this time I should get out some essential oils. I already know that's an option because I just have to look at the list. Right. That's on. Yeah. The thing is, it's so important to have tools. It's not just about like, let's just see where the process takes me. But if you want to be intentional and a little bit more in control of your experience, including your emotions and your emotional well-being moving through this, you need tools around you in terms of where can I turn when things get hard? And 100%. And it's also so important the way the brain works. Like mm -hmm. you have to practice those tools when you're not in a fight, flight, yeah. freeze, fall response. You can't just practice them when you're upset yep. because you're trying to rewire your brain. Mm -hmm. And so you have to practice them when you're pretty zen, right? Yeah. When you're pretty like chill, like, oh, I'm going to do some yoga today just because it feels good. And then your body learns the pattern of, oh, I can use that to chill out. Yes. Or to get back online with my brain. Yes. Right? Yes. So you, know, you hear people talking about working on themselves or doing the work and or people say, Oh, you should really do some self care. Like I I really don't I know you are aligned with it, but I really hate it when someone tells me to go take care of myself. Like, right. <laughs> awesome. What is that um, mean? Of course I take care of myself. But, yeah, it's mm -hmm. not going to a spa. It's not doing, it may be a, a tiny thing like um, 
not engaging with a text for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. That might be tougher, right? Yes. So I think that, yeah, the more you can practice this stuff just in, and it works, I think, for people who choose to stay as well, right? Because yep. you're going to need the tools. You need and tools. As human. I mean, we're <laughs> just human beings, right? That's right. Human beings out here humaning, doing the very best we can. <laughs> So what would be what would be one thing that you would tell someone who's sort of staring at that ring of fire that we talk about? Um, they're staring down the ring of fire and they know that this is the right answer, but they're just terrified and they suspect that they will not be able, that their partner will not maintain this peaceful, loving sort of approach. What would be one thing you would tell them? Oh, just one. Um, well, well, or two or three, yeah. whatever. Gosh, what a great question. I think um, I would say don't go it alone. Mm -hmm. I would say community that is, is so important. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, what was that? Community is so important. Yeah. Knowing that you're not alone. I think it helps to have people that know you really, really well. Mm -hmm. I think it helps to have people that don't know you since your youth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think coaching matters. I think therapy matters. I, I mean, it, it was a whole package mm -hmm. for me. Um, and I just have to pause for a moment to say like, what a privilege I have that I could, I was able to provide that for myself. Sure. Um, however, you know, where, regardless of where I am financially now, that one of the first things you said to me is I want this to be the best money you've ever spent on yourself. Mm -hmm hands down no question so invest i going into that ring and ring of fire i would i would say invest in yourself yeah. whatever that looks like be it getting more family and friends on board be it um you know taking whatever you can to bolster yourself to get through the ring of fire before you jump into it um matters yes go in with a plan Go in with practicing your language. All of those steps really, really paid off because when the reaction with a high conflict person was not what we might have hoped, I just let that pass through me. I did not react to it. Yes. Because it was so well bolstered. So that would be it. Just, just get your, um, take care of yourself enough so that you can go into it. You know, I think Brene Brown says like strong back, soft front, wild heart. Yeah. To get that. Yeah. Something, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's the posture to take into it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That would be my, my response. And if yeah. you're feeling like you still need to get to that place, ask for help. Like it, it's not a, ask for help. Yes. We are not human beings are not meant to go these things alone. Right. We're not built for this. We shouldn't be experts in it. You haven't done this before, or even if you did, you've done it like once, like, yeah. and, and this time will be different no matter what. So yeah, there's no shame. And just saying like, I need some help. I need some support around me right now. Yeah. And I was mm -hmm. shamed with, oh, you're just like my, my parents are divorced. You're just like your mom. You, you, mm -hmm. I knew you'd do this. You're such a, you know, name call, name call. Yeah. And I just was able to turn around and say, I am strong like my mother. I really admire her for standing up for herself. So I also had some thinking about myself. Yeah. That was really powerful that I could use. Yeah, you get to yeah. choose that. You get to choose. You can say you're just like your mom and you can say, yeah, I absolutely am in, in many great yeah. ways. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I know everyone's going to want to know where are you now? How are you doing? How are the kids doing? Um, I know it's still in process. So <laughs> well, we are not we are not going to sugarcoat things, Sharon. It's still a, a daily um, something that shows up in my journal every single day. Okay. It is. I am not technically divorced. Right. Um, we have reached one piece of our settlement um, through a, after a 13 hour mediation, which is unheard of. But um, when you are engaging with this type of, of situation and be prepared for it to be unconventional. Mm -hmm. 
things may go very slowly. Things may go really fast. I don't know that my experience was it has gone slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, there needs to be a lot of hand holding. Sometimes there needs to, to be repeat like, oh, here's step A, just do first thing and do step B. Yeah. Um, and the attorneys can handle all of that. Can I back up for just two seconds? I don't want to. There is a tendency in the divorce world right now, in my experience, for people to really want to label people like, oh, that guy's a narcissist. That guy a, has a personality disorder. Yep. That woman, mm-hmm. that woman is off her rock, whatever it is. And one of the most powerful things that worked really well for me was never to label anyone something I don't know. I am not a psychologist. Right. I am not here to speak to their experience at all. All I can speak to is what's happening in my my experience. So one thing that is super freeing for people is to let go of the label. It doesn't matter. Right. right. It absolutely he's, doesn't he's matter. Bipolar. So, he's Asperger's that never been diagnosed, but you've diagnosed him. Like and it could be nothing. It could be trauma. I mean right. that's not nothing. Or it could no. be like it's not a diagnosable thing. Um And so where I am today is just leading with compassion, like, oh, this is happening for a reason. Everybody's doing the best they can. I am not divorced. Uh, I have something unimaginable in my life, which is I have a 50-50 parenting plan. I went from being the, and that's in process still, we didn't finalize it, but we listened to what our kids wanted. Mm -hmm. And... I went from being the primary parent doing everything, as I said earlier, like this guy was not participating. Yeah. And I thought when I said it was over that um, the kids would stay with me until he kind of got it together. And we did do a little bit of a gentle kind of increase over time, but the kids are week on week off with mom and dad. It broke my heart initially. Um, because I was used to being with them all the time. It's one of the reasons I felt like I couldn't leave. And now I can just see them thriving and it's, it's okay. And a lot of, one of my fears was that they would have the experience with him that I did, that he would continue to berate, be little, you know, feel small in front of them. And then that hasn't happened after about a year's time. It did happen for a while. The kids were put in the middle that's gotten so much better. Um, so where I am today is we're splitting our time. Um, I'm still working with an attorney and needing to pay for that. Mm -hmm. I'm working more. I am living more of my best life. Um, I will say that when you are not yet divorced and don't have the paper, dating is challenging. Mm -hmm. So I don't choose that right now. Mm -hmm. Um, men don't really want to, anything to do with women who are really divorced. Right. And understandably so. Makes sense. Like I would choose that on the flip side. So right. Um my kids are good. They're communicating. My 16 year old is a driver's license. Life has gone on. Yes. Right. Oh that is Um, so that is so great to like bring it to a close. Life has gone on. Life is going to keep rolling. It doesn't stop for anything or anyone. And some days you know, today I got an angry text mm. out of the blue for something that was not in my control. And I was just able to say, oh, gosh, I'm sorry that happened. Uh, this is another option on my end. And yeah. that was it. I love it. Julie, thank yeah. you so, so much, seriously, for sharing your experience with such a big, open heart. <laughs> I, you know, I love and adore you and appreciate you in so many ways, but I love also sharing your brilliance with my community. So thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Well, I would be remiss not to say that I would not be having this conversation if you had not helped save my soul. So <laughs> I, not, uh, I, I am so indebted to you in a heartwarming way, like in a loving way, not like a I would jump in front of a bus for sure. (laughs) No one's doing that. (laughs) No one's doing that. No. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart. Um, And I'm so honored like now to know you as a human, right? (laughs) Like I'm just like, I found 
you as one of my people and I'm so grateful um, that you were able to see me and see my experience and see what was happening for me because you had your own experience and your own wisdom and working with people. I just felt so seen by you and I still do to this day. So it is my privilege right. to see you, my darling. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate you Thanks taking this time. Me. All right. We'll talk soon, honey. Love you. If you're listening to this podcast because you're struggling to decide whether to stay or go in your marriage and you're serious about finding that answer, it's time to book a truth and clarity session with a member of my team. On the call, we'll discuss where you are in your marriage and explore if there's a fit for you and I to work together so you can make and execute the right decision for you and your marriage. Go to clarityformymarriage.com to fill out an application now. That's clarityformymarriage.com.